Smoking Joe Frazier is one of the most iconic fighters in the history of boxing. He was the undisputed heavyweight champion from 1970 to 73, while also being in the famous golden era of heavyweights, which may never be repeated. But arguably, it was his rivalry and shared trilogy with the greatest, Muhammad Ali, in their iconic fights, including the fight of the century and the thriller in Manila, which will put Frazier down as an all-time great. Despite Frazier's brilliant performance and iconic win in the first encounter with Ali, he has never received the same acclamation and popularity compared to his rival. However, in today's video, I want to focus on and break down Smokin' Joe's style of fighting and examine the techniques to show you why he was one of the greatest heavyweights of all time, but also why we should truly appreciate what he brought to the sport of boxing. So on that note, let's get right into it. First up, let's look at Frazier's background and amateur career. Throughout the majority of his whole childhood in the 1940s and 50s, Joe worked as a farm boy in South Carolina with his family, which no doubt helped build up so much of his natural strength. On Friday nights when he was with his family, they would take breaks from their farm duties and would set up to watch boxing, tuning in to watch the likes of Sugar Ray Robinson and Rocky Marciano. One night watching boxing, Joe Frazier's uncle, Israel, noticed his stocky build, saying, that boy there, that boy is going to be another Joe Lewis. These words stuck with Joe as a dream to become a great boxer like Lewis became clear. Frazier then would start to practice with homemade punching bags made from corn cobs, moss and bricks. At the age of 15 though, Frazier would then leave home and eventually settle in the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, which would eventually adopt Joe as one of their own. He would first have to get a job in a slaughterhouse and would actually practice his jab on slabs of hanging meat, which ended up being an inspiration behind the famous scene in Rocky 1. But eventually, he would find the local police athletic league gym, where his amateur story would begin. As an amateur, Smoke and Joe beat all newcomers and won the Golden Gloves three years in a row. In 1964, he lost to Buster Matus in the US Heavyweight Olympic Trials controversially but the stars were aligned for Joe as Matus got injured and was instead called up to the Tokyo Olympics in 1964. It was here he crushed opponents with his famous left hook and even fractured his thumb in the semi-finals and had to hide his injury so he could fight in the final against Hans Huber. He would win in that final and finish his amateur career with a record of 38 for two. And from watching the footage, you can tell his style very much resembled what he was to become. But this leads me on to how Joe would fight throughout his professional career. Frazier's Boxing Style First up, let's touch on Frazier's style of fighting. Now for Smoking Joe, he was not the biggest heavyweight of all time as he stood at 5'11 and a reach of 73 and a half inches with many feeling he would be too short to compete in the pros despite him winning gold at the Tokyo Olympics. Joe's trainer, Yang Durham, saw things differently and played an integral part in developing Frazier to become one of the most dangerous and explosive heavyweights we have ever seen. Under Durham's tutelage, he took advantage of Frazier's flaws and instead looked for a way to use his natural strengths and genetics to create a pressure swarmer style, learning how to close off the ring before getting to work on the inside looking to tire opponents with big body shots, all with the intention of setting up his devastating signature left hook up top, which Joe threw so well. Credit also must go to the legendary trainer Eddie Futch, who was in Joe's corner early in his career and also become Joe's lead trainer after Durham's death. Futch played an integral role helping Frazier to add in other elements into his game plan, including throwing the right hand more towards the end of his career. Uh, did, you, did you plan anything different? Yes, we planned to use more right hands against Poirier this time. You did. Uh, we knew that he would be looking for the left hook all the time, so we planned uh, to use more right hands to, to make the left hook more effective. However, it was his huge contribution to the game plan that would defeat Muhammad Ali in his defining win, which I'll discuss later. Another aspect to consider is Joe grew up idolizing Henry Armstrong. And when you consider this was one of his idols, it can become evident 
what also inspired his own style, as the similarities are there between the two. But now let's look at the individual areas and techniques of his style that made him so successful. Pressure Fighter and Rhythm Now as just mentioned before, Joe was smaller in height and reach than most opponents, so a lot of his overall game plan was to put his competitors under constant pressure, so he could close the distance while also making them rush their work so he could get on the inside and counter them. One of the things Fraser did so well was to keep his opponents guessing through his use of constant feints with his upper body, head, guard and punches, alongside with broken rhythm. His use of feints alone helped his unpredictable rhythm that would cause much caution for his opponent in terms of what Fraser would do next, and it was evident even from watching at the sidelines that it was hard to predict what his next move or punch would be. Many opponents even get caught with a jab or a leaping hook out of nowhere as they mistime their own punch due to the use of the unpredictable nature of his rhythm. When you consider his name was Smoking, these tactics almost act as a smoke screen for him to apply pressure and attack. Another aspect that helped him with his forward movement and pressure was his footwork. One way was just using a quick pivot with his front foot to continue his attack while also creeping into range slowly with his front foot. But interestingly, he would actually use a lot of reverse footwork at times, moving his back foot first before moving in with his front foot, mainly with the aim to help him close the distance to get on the inside and to put weight on his front foot so he could then throw that left hook with power. Now, this isn't something I recommend anyone to try as you can quite often lose balance or get timed with a punch and get badly hurt. However, in the case of Joe Frazier, he got away with it most of the time due to his elite level of being able to bob and weave so successfully. And as much as he would lose balance at times in fights, as he brought his feet together, he also did have tremendous balance when you consider he was changing levels with his upper body while moving forward. Which leads me on to what he arguably did best. The Bob and Weave Explained now, sometimes I see people refer to Frazier as having a bob and weave style, but I see this as an element of his overall swarmer style to get him into a position to attack or get in the inside. By bobbing and weaving, Joe can move his head both laterally and beneath incoming punches, while it also helped that he would bend his knees slightly and use waist movement while coming into distance. Fundamentally a wrong move, but he would get away with it due to his crab cross guard being able to block his head and body to block uppercuts or other punches. Nevertheless, it would not work out against bigger, stronger men such as George Foreman, who was able to really control him with his stiff, powerful jab and arm control. But the erratic nature of him doing this even before he was in a distance to attack helped him to become more unpredictable with his rhythm and attacks, and quite often he would use his left hook after using the bob and weave techniques. Interestingly, trainer Eddie Futch explained why he trained Joe to use this. He said, I taught Joe to bob and weave so he wasn't in rhythm. You see the speed bag? As long as it is coming straight back, you can close your eyes all night long and hit it. But if it wobbles a little bit, then you have to hesitate to find where it's coming from. I wanted Joe's head to do that. In the first fight against Muhammad Ali, this was the perfect solution against an outboxer like him, as he would like to use his jab and quick counters and combinations. As Eddie Futch explained, all the bobbing and weaving dropped Joe lower and made an even smaller target, so that meant Ali, the 6 foot 3 fighter, dropping his right hand down to throw the uppercut. It would leave his right side exposed for the length of time that it would take Joe to land that devastating left hook. If you watch the fight The Century or any of the other fights, you will see Joe expertly time Ali many times throughout the fights doing this, as it forced Ali to aim lower to hit the target, making him susceptible to being hit up top. And of course, Frazier was able to land one of the most famous left hooks we've ever seen. Bobbing and weaving really is a beautiful form of aggressive defense and offense put into one and Joe certainly mastered this in his overall style and size. The left hook. 
This leads me on to more about his left too. And obviously, as I've just discussed, a big part of this punch was of course the transfer of weight onto his left side using bobbing weaving motions and movement, therefore allowing him to throw the punch with such power. There's a great video by former world champion Tim Witherspoon who was once taught by Frazier in his gym how to throw the left hook. Tim goes into detail on how Joe really emphasised on putting as much weight between the knee and the ankle before twisting with the shoulder. I highly recommend you check it out on Tim's channel and I'll leave it in the description below. You can then start to understand how Joe applied it himself with his technique to generate the unreal power. The other thing I love about the left hook is he really missed with it. When he threw it, it was always with the intention to land, but it was also about timing his opponent with it after they threw a jab, or if he saw the right hand drop as discussed earlier when he faced Ali. The other aspect of this punch was he was able to throw double left hooks beautifully by going to the body first before going up top. The perfect motto for this strategy is, kill the body and the head will die. The attacks to the body would lead to openings up top as the guard would drop, and we saw Frazier land on the legs of Ali consistently with this tactic, but my favourite has to be against Bob Foster when using this. Frazier of course would use this punch as kind of a gazelle punch as soon as the weight was on the front foot, and leap forward to attack up top which also made his left hook very unpredictable at times. Inside fighting. Now the other area Joe was outstanding was his elite ability to fight on the inside, and this is where he wanted to fight you. Due to Frazier's smaller reach and height compared to most, it was the perfect range for him to attack the body, usually with right and left hooks before throwing sharp uppercuts through the guard. Joe also heavily relied on using his head to lean on mainly the left side of his opponent's shoulder to apply pressure, but to protect himself from opposing hooks. He would also use his head to put pressure on the chest to either push back his competitors or restrict them with the punches they could throw due to the possibility of losing balance or getting pushed back. But at the same time, due to his horizontal crab cross guard, he would use his arm to frame off opponents on the inside so he could continue to get his own punches, or just continue pushing back his competitors. Frazier would also look to use arm control to restrict his opponent to only being able to punch back with one arm. Lastly, Frazier would continue to roll on the inside, especially in coming hooks, as his anticipation was truly up there with the best, and of course, Frazier would look to counter back himself. Final thoughts. As someone who was inspired to start boxing because of Ali, Joe Frazier was always part of that history. But as I've gotten older and studied more about the sweet science and the history of boxing, you can't help but truly appreciate Joe Frazier's unique aggressive swarmer style, which is something you don't often see today. His use of constant fainting, unpredictable rhythm, aggressive bob and weave defence tactics, and of course his deadly left hooks makes you truly appreciate all his achievements. However, at the same time, I also feel bad for Joe in a way. He was a man who was always in the shadow of Ali despite all his own triumphs. He beat the greatest convincingly, being so technically sound while being so fierce at the same time. Watching Joe Frazier is watching poetry in motion to me, and that is why he will go down as one of the greatest heavyweights of all time. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on Joe Frazier. Is there a specific part of his style you liked? Or what was your favourite fight you like to go back and watch? I'd love to know. This has been Jamie from Boxing Life. Thank you so much for watching. I'll leave you with this final clip of Joe. I'll see you in the next one. Joe, the whole world used to stop when you used to fight Ali and also when Foreman was involved in those amazing fights in the early 70s. How proud are you to have been involved now in what were those amazing moments when, when literally the world stopped to watch two guys slugging each other out? Yeah. I, I would say, John, it was a lot of excitement at that time. Matter of fact, I think that we, uh, two athletes that shut New York down and I would say the whole entire world were there and they see all the excitement going on. And, and I won that one, and that was the one I really needed to win.